Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I would like to introduce to you now, without further ado, America's most fabulous World War II ace, member of the original Free Pearl Harbor American Volunteer Group that are known as the Flying Tigers. He's the holder of the Congressional Medal of Honor. He's the author of a non-fiction bestseller on his exploits and rebuilding of his life entitled Dada Black Sheep. He is also a member of the Burbank Group, that's Burbank, California Group of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it gives me a great deal of pleasure to give to you Colonel Gregory Patty. U.S. Marine Corps, retire. Thank you, Ray. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members of Alcoholics Anonymous, and distinguished guests. I am happy an alcoholic, and I'm thrilled, astonished, and grateful that I was invited here at this lovely gathering this evening. This kind of brings back memories of the 20 months that I spent in a Japanese prison camp. I talked about a lot of things, but one thing was something that I wanted to do. I wanted to get back here and have a drink on top of the mark. Well, this is a far cry from that, but uh, this is much, much better, believe me. I had my drink in the mark. I had about eight of them here. Cups of coffee. I... I'm going to give what is called a typical AA pitch, as we call it here in California, for the benefit of those of you who are not members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what we do is share our strength, hope, and experiences with each other. Tell something about what we're like, what happened, and what we're like now. Of course, what I talk about is mainly what I was like, because in direct proportion to the 42 years that I had before I came on Alcoholics Anonymous and to the three and a half since then, uh, that's why it's that away. Anyhow, I'm, most of my life, basically, I was a person that uh, never belonged to society. Member of uh, a few famous groups and other accomplishments, but, uh, I never felt that I really belonged. And another thing, I was never satisfied with anything that I thought that I wanted. When I attained it, or almost had it within my grasp, I knew it wasn't what I wanted. And it seems strange to some, not to me anymore, that when I hit uh, this organization of Alcoholics Anonymous, I liked them right off the bat and have ever since. First group of society that I ever felt I belonged to. And uh, with this help, I've joined other groups gradually of society. I say taking my place in society like a normal person. I want to thank Paul for those kind words on the hero business. I uh, I hate the sound of the word uh, for myself personally because I was well, not a hero. I did just what I damn well pleased. And uh, I guess that was mixed up with being a hero. And if I'd have felt like running, I'd have done that too. So uh, we'll go from there. My drinking career didn't start until I was out of college and in cadet training as a Marine down in Pensacola in 1935. And uh, I didn't drink in my high school days, my college days, because I came from a small town in Idaho, and I didn't like the way my relatives drank. And uh, being a small town, everybody knew what everybody else did. They weren't alcoholics as I know them now, uh, but they sure as heck ruined Christmases and other great occasions for the, the kids. And so I never wanted anything to do with it. Uh, I guess the fact that uh, there's Irish and Indian mixed in it uh, didn't uh, make me an alcoholic, but didn't, uh, I don't help probably. Anyhow, it's neither here nor there how I became one. I realized that. And I think the biggest thing of this whole thing is when I finally got around to finding out it's no disgrace to be an alcoholic. 
for years I thought it was. And uh, to uh, drink like a man, people told me to, uh, what I tried to do for a long, long time until finally I just didn't give a darn I was going to drink anyhow. But my first drinking started down when I knew in Pensacola, Florida, when I knew I was going to get a regular commission, 1935. They were hard to get in those days. They only had eight of them out that first time, Marine Corps Commission. And I was told that I was going to have one because I'd passed high in the examination. Anyhow, this first cocktail party, I figured I was at the opposite ends of the United States as far as I, way as I could get to my relatives. Of course, I don't feel this way about them anymore. I know they did the best they could, and they still do. And uh, those that aren't here, God rest them too. But... Uh, I figure, well, I'm an officer and a gentleman, and they have this social system here, and so that first cocktail party, I made a statement. A lot of statements I made in the past come back to me now. And this one was, uh, I don't know why I stayed away from this stuff for so long, because this was made for me. And being a person that was never satisfied with anything he had, this did what I wanted. And as I made these frequent trips, the evening wore on into the bathroom, while I was washing my hands, I looked in the mirror and I became more handsome. <laughs> and I was taller. I always want to be taller. And I was a little bashful around women. But uh, liquor fixed that. Because uh, being a blackout artist from the start, I got the tale the next day that I didn't care whose daughter I snapped that night. <laughs> At first, I thought, fellow classmates, of course, I provided a lot of laughs for the boys in the service, and I guess uh, others too. But there were some people that were trying to help me. They didn't know how. And they would tell me these things. And some senior officers, too, I'd right offer that in a friendly way. And uh, about the drinking, to slow it down, you know, just have a few, and like everybody else, have a good time. So I thought at first they were trying to ruin my fun. And they were lying to me about uh, what they said I did. And I know uh, right off the bat there, I mean matter of a few weeks, I started telling myself, well, now I'm not going to have another drink until Saturday night. And a little later, I, I always did this where somebody could hear me because I wanted them to know that I was uh, giving for doing something for other people. And then pretty soon when the fences got a little graver, I said, I'm not going to take a drink for a month. And then as time wore on, I got to the point where I said, I'm not going to take a drink for a year. And at the tail end of this 20 years of periodic drinking, I said many, many times, I'm never going to take a drink as long as I live. Well, let's get back to the week deal. I didn't make that either. <laughs> Well, on about Friday night, say, well, I'm a great guy to talk to myself. Say, well, I'm like, guys, this is Friday afternoon. I'm smarter than the rest of these pilots around here and cadets. I know that. Also stronger. I don't know why in the dickens I can't take a few beers, the rest of the boys. So I talk myself into it. I'd have a few beers, and then my favorite expression came up, this stuff bloats me. <laughs> it never bloated me, because I can drink gallons of coffee, gallons of water, gallons of anything it pours. But what was wrong with this beer was that it wasn't strong enough. So then I would say it bloated me, and I would switch to my favorite bourbon and soda. And I remember having a good time. Sometimes I'd even remember some nice bites. And then I wouldn't remember. And I would wonder what in the heck I'd done the next day, you know, and I unglued the first sticky eye and start thinking. But I found out people were willing to tell me. <laughs> this regular commission that I told myself I wanted all through college, before I took this examination, I apparently didn't want that at all because I abused of something frightful. I 
finally wandered back to Pensacola, uh, 1940, as an instructor. And, uh, I was married. You're not supposed to say anybody else an alcoholic, but you have your opinion. Uh, So, my first wife thought I was an SOB, and I thought she was one. <laughs> then we figured that if we got rid of each other, that would end the drinking. Well, as near as I can tell, and I haven't done any checking through the last eight marriages, uh, but uh, <laughs> well, not mine, those are hers. Uh, it didn't do me any good, because I drank more than ever. And along about 41 there, some of these nasty people, San Diego where I've been stationed, Quantico, Virginia, and so forth, wrote letters, mind you, into the Commandant of the Marine Corps and told him that I didn't pay my bill. So, I was instructed by the Commandant to send him a letter each month. And on the first one, he wanted to every firm I owed money and offered them how much. And each and every month thereafter, I was to put down how much I was paying on each one of these. Now, previous to that, I never found it difficult to lie verbally because I figured most people never remembered. But I found out it was just as easy to lie in writing. Those bills were coming down something terrific. Actually, I was proud of the results there. I had. <laughs> but actually, they were getting higher. Well, one thing, uh, being a regular officer, you were obligated for $2,500 worth of uniform with a full dress and all that jazz, you know, and, uh, I think I paid 40 or 5 bucks, I think, in, uh, 6 years. Uh, <laughs> so, when they were, I had to have, I had to go somewhere, and they didn't have these, uh, ballistic missiles that are going around the moon at that time, or I'd have gotten to more than one of those, believe me. <laughs> but, uh, I was solving, I was looking for an answer, and, uh, so I remember I cashed a check there in the San Carlos Hotel, and they were very lenient with the, those regular officers, because they knew that they could always get a hold of us, and, uh, it was just a few days before payday, and I wasn't one of those methodical chaps that kept his check up straight, I mean, I knew darn well that it was gone, but, uh, I wrote out a check for 20 bucks, and they cashed it, and by the time they got a hold of me, I know it's the payday, and I tell them it was an oversight, and uh, they'd have their money. That was my routine. And I knew my answer was inside of that bar there, in that air-conditioned bar. And somebody said, boy, aren't you lucky. He says, see, they're recruiting pilots to go over with Shanks. And I said, well, how can you get out of the service and whatnot? And I said, well, don't talk to me. I said, i got to have a couple of three doubles here before I can think. And then the guy talked out and talked about this. I said, where is this recruiting man? Upstairs in such and such a suite. Up I went. And man, that guy heard the most story about the most fantastic pilot in the world. That was me. And, and of course, I was talking to one that uh, was fantastic, too, because he was a retired Air Corps boy, and he was in uh, Lafayette Escadrille, and he wore his wings around his civilian clothes. <laughs> and I... I can see that face to this day. Look like a rubber sponge being massaged in a hand. He told me that there would be men leading us that had 20 years combat experience. Boy, I thought over my mind because I thought I was an aviation lover. Boy, this guy must be wrong because 18 years of that had have to be under a tombstone. And then he said we'd be flying against people who wore thick lenses. And we're not mechanical like the we boys were. Well, incidentally, he was going to lead one of these squadrons, too. And this guy, I thought, by gosh, he's still back in Gay Paris drinking champagne and uh, brandy with uh, Cherie. Anyhow, part of what he said had to be right. Oh, another thing which is very important in my character, that, uh, of course, we're getting 500 bucks beside that good salary, twice what we got in the service. For knocking down Japanese planes. Now, we weren't at war with Japan, then. And he said these would be unarmed transports, nine out of ten of them. <laughs> well, I wasn't above me, you know, picking up money like that to pay off cargo. So 
So when he, we stayed two weeks here, I was in the third detachment that went over, and uh, we weren't supposed to uh, tell anybody anything but what they were put on our passports. These were made up in Washington, D.C. This is a Roosevelt idea. A missionary is what they were. And we went around all these bars, and we told every bartender, missionary, anybody sitting on the stool. So uh, they, they knew we, we were drunk, but uh, I guess they also knew we were nuts, too. <laughs> Maybe I could just speak for myself. But, but on the boat there, it was, all, it was all a secret. Here was this recruiting Air Corps boy, retired, Lafayette Escadel wings. Had his uniform on, Lafayette Escadel wings down here. The other wings up here. It's supposed to be a secret. But, <laughs> down on the boat, shaking hands with us. Tears coming out of his eyes, running down over those wrinkles. Uh, I won't use that word. I use it as tag. It's like crocodile tears. And he says, he's awful sorry, but uh, he's not going to be able to go with us. <laughs> and I didn't know that was the last group who was ever going out of there. I just knew it was the third. Anyhow, I got over in a league where we had no rank. They couldn't court-martial me, although people threatened to. And I noticed numerous things while I was over there. The only reason I did is because being a drunk, I knew I was dead wrong. And if I'm wrong, i got to find out how everybody else is wrong. And boy, I guess I did a beautiful job of it. And whenever I argued, I got sick, and I had some beauties over there. I got along uh, very well in a league like that without discipline, even though I was a pass-out drunk. I'll just give you one of my things. I know one night somebody, and I, they had every reason in the world to beat me up at any time. But uh, one night somebody did it, and I didn't remember or didn't know who did it. The next morning, I woke up quite early, and I asked who did it. And it was a chap that was sound asleep in his cot. And so I thought, uh, well, my psychology was is to have people fear you, and then they won't uh, bother you with those inopportune times when I'm enabled to fight. Not that I disliked it, I loved it. And uh, so I kicked this fellow off the cot, and uh, of course he never did get to his feet. And uh, I'm sorry to say I walked on his face rather severely a few other places, but anyhow, people let me alone when I was walking around blacked out. I was teaching him a lesson, I told myself. I know a little lighter side there, uh, one of my pilot friends over there, a wonderful guy, I went over to see him at his uh, apartment, and I have a lovely swimming pool there, and one of his newer friends there insisted that I take a drink. This was a short time ago, and I said, no, I'm not drinking today, and, and this guy kept on, and so this fellow Smith says, he says, for God's sake, don't insist. He said, uh, boy, I, re- I like the way Greg is now. He says, I remember... When we were sitting in that adobe bar there in Kunming, China, and he said, we'd be lying politely to each other, you know, spinning yarn. And he says, that big, thick door would shudder, and that adobe would fall off around the door jam. He says, we knew what was coming in, because he says, this guy never opened the door with his hands. He just kicked him in. He'd come in with his hair down his eyes. I don't have to worry about it much anymore. And he said he knew what he wanted. He wanted to fight, and he says he didn't even know who his friends were. He'd fight everybody. Of course, the big fight I was fighting was, was booze, and uh, I think that was basically the cause of why I fought everything else. I left this uh, group a month early after telling off and all. I'm not sorry I did that, but it's just the manner I did it that I shouldn't have chosen that way. But that's neither here nor there. That's all gone. That was what I was like. I got back home. Word was sent ahead. They tried to keep me out of the Marine Corps. So I parked cars for a couple of months, the same job I had when I went my way through college in Seattle. That's all I could get. So I decided to uh, go over everybody's head, so I went down to one of the state liquor stores, got a couple of bottles of bourbon. Was well into the second one when I had a three-page Night letter masterpiece, I call it, composed to the Secretary of the Navy. And when I read that off over the phone, it was no strain. Not with a good fifth and a half 
to me. Not that a mom has anything to do with it, the way you feel and think. But I got results. I guess they must have kicked aviation headquarters around there, and, uh, oh, I put such things in there. Understand there's a war going on, and nobody's doing very good today. And there's only so many aces, and incidentally, I'm one. I have six planes. I understand the United States, uh, stands up for it. It's, uh, the deals it makes, especially the ones in writing. In case you're interested in mine, you'll find it in Admiral Nimitz's secret safe. That I'll be reinstated without loss of president. And this is one of Roosevelt's deals. So I guess I got it in two days, and, uh, when I was, uh, I got four days delayed to get into San Diego, and I was thanking my lucky stars when I was on that train that they didn't ship me to Washington, D.C., because they'd have killed me if I'd have flown in there. I got overseas. There's words sent ahead there to keep me out of the squadron. But again, I finally figured a way to have one commanding officer there who was desperate for some replacement squadron. I, I didn't really care much about it, except I knew he had a case of whiskey under his cot. If I barged in there, he would offer me a drink. I would engage him in conversation. Before he knew it, I would have a whole bottle of his whiskey in me. And this happened, and I told him how he could have a squadron overnight. And that's how this black sheep squadron was formed. Because he was a man that didn't go go back on his word that he made the night before when he was drinking. Of course, I wasn't that type. I was the kind of guy that wanted to help everybody. And uh, I promised things to everybody, including marriage, that uh, that, that didn't... Uh, I mean, stuff that I knew was off in the future and I wouldn't have to fulfill. But I did sincerely, uh, I and mean, that was my way of wanting to help people. The only trouble was, anybody who accepted my help was was uh, like the kiss of death. And the reason I wanted this squadron, because I knew it was easy enough to shoot down a few planes, and I could live the life I wanted. I was the type of person that hated always, regardless of where I was along the ladder, the next two ranks above me. <laughs> and out in the Marine Corps, South Pacific, I, that happened to be lieutenant colonels and colonels. But I found it very easy to go around them and over them. I don't mean to say that all these people were right and I was completely wrong. It's a good thing I was a drunk in many instances and did go around them and over them. But I, I wasn't honestly doing anything I did for uh, the democratic way of life or anything else. I was doing it strictly for myself. And the reason I wanted a squadron is because I was untouchable with the lieutenant colonel and colonel as a squadron commander. I could deal directly with generals, the ones I liked. Another thing, I had the right to pick my own flight surgeon. And I had a wonderful southern gentleman who knew the difference between poisonous alcohol and non-poisonous alcohol. <laughs> There were some flight surgeons that didn't believe their boys should get drunk. And so they kind of limited the uh, free Lee John Brandy. I don't mean to run down that name, Lee John. I, I love this stuff. Uh, but anyhow, my flight surgeon got what others didn't want. So we had a very good supply. Nobody got a rub down. We drank it all up. Anyhow, my routine finally developed. Well, of course, there's another little item there to which we got this, uh, brandy. Whenever you were out in a combat zone and saw enemy planes, you didn't have to necessarily engage them, but you just see them in the air, and that was supposed to be quite a shock to the nervous system. Actually, I guess it was to many. But, uh, seeing the angry red meatballs, as we call the Japanese and signal. But to me, I could see those planes anytime, whether they're there or weren't there. <laughs> And uh, any time you reported seeing them in the air, you got free bandy when you got back in the nation. So that was my reason. And well, after I got that squad, and practically every night I drank myself to, to sleep. And when I retired, I wasn't getting up anymore until I uh, got real early in the morning and somebody was assigned to wake me up and I'd given them instructions and threaten them if they didn't, or they always did. But anyhow, I took the mattress off this cot of mine, there these cots, pulled out cots, you know, with a big basket weave canvas, and I take the mattress off and the blankets, 
And if somebody didn't put a mosquito net over me, I didn't have one. Mosquito didn't bother me. Because I couldn't feel them. <laughs> Anyhow, the reason the mattress and the, and the blankets were off this thing was because when I retired, I wasn't getting up anymore to go to the bathroom. And the loose back would be there, let everything go right to it. <laughs> Boy, that's the life of a hero, huh? <laughs> Four o'clock in the morning, time comes to get up for free down takeoff. I had my crew instructed. They came in. Shaking no good. They threw water at me, and then while I was trying to swing at them and rolling off this cot, they would get out of the tent. I crawl out on my hands and knees most of the time. Sometimes I had my skivvy shorts out, most of the time nothing. I'd get out there beside my tent like a dog on all fours, and I'd look up about a block of where the mess hall light was. But I didn't see one light. I saw three, four, five, or six sometimes. It varied. I knew I'd kill myself taking off in the dark if I could see more than one light there when I, when I knew there was only one. So I'd taken the precaution. We drunks are very unique in taking precautionary measures to get us on the road so we can get to our job, whether we're a bookkeeper, a painter, or, or anything else. And what I'd have done was uh, get the ground crew down there to take one of these 55-gallon gasoline drums and the settling torch right around the center, and it makes a nice little tub. And this was parked under the eaves of my tent. And in early in the morning, that water feels awful cool, you know, rain water. So I let these lights, and I'd crawl over, and I'd drop my head and shoulders up there and go, or off like that. And I'd bring the lights down a few, and then I'd repeat this process until I'd get it down to one light. This all had to occur before the boys could get me in the Jeep and drive down the field and take off in the dark for the free dawn takeoff. But my good time ended. I was Shot down, see, picked up by the Japanese, and they don't serve uh, cocktails or beer. I was shot down on January 3rd, 1944, and by, well, I was pretty badly shot up, but my wounds healed up, even though I was severely shot up, much faster than many others who just had scratches and died of infection. And I know when I first came back and was on a bond tour drive, I looked at the people in the audience, and I said, the reason mine healed up so rapidly was because I was in such beautiful shape before I got down. I changed that story and many others. I know now the reason that uh, my wounds healed up, because I was fighting blues so hard that uh, merely taking it away from me uh, gave uh, my body strength, and that's why they healed up. By Christmas time, we got permission to uh, sing Christmas carols. The guards like to hear us sing. I was in Japan by then, or I was after six weeks. So I started feeling real saintly. Yes, yeah, almost a year off food. So then, uh, while well, some of the prisoners were talking about how their mother used to cook and whatnot, I was around telling these characters, you know, it'll only be a week or so, and I will have been on the wagon a year. This time I knew darn well I was going to make it. They looked at me like I was completely back. Shook their head. Well, who should say? They're right. Anyhow, I didn't quite make that year, not even in the Japanese prison camp. The head guard there in this camp asked me if I would mind staying up and keeping the fire going for the New Year's Eve dealing. Now, it seems at midnight every Japanese life starts, regardless of when he was born during the year. And they prepare food all day, special food and everything else for this. Now, he told me to give me a package of cigarettes. That I love. I just love to smoke. I've been beaten several times just for smoking cigarettes when I was close to this camp. I didn't miss a drink. Well, I mean, I knew I couldn't have one. Anyhow... He came in with a wooden case with uh, some bottles in it, and I recognized it as baggy. And my this kitchen was blacked out because uh, planes had been over. There, this is Christmas Eve there, start of 44. I mean, start of 45. So I knew I was supposed to keep...
keep these warm at a certain temperature, and I could have my tea and smoke a package of cigarettes to my content. I was all alone in that kitchen. I had no intention of taking any of their sake, because I knew darn well that uh, I probably, on such an occasion as this was, I'd probably been shot or at least beaten to death, or I would have died, and I knew what folks felt like. And I was just as happy as I've ever been in my life up to that date, sitting there all by myself, thinking, on the wall be all there, and smoking cigarettes, sipping tea. And it was warm in there, because our cells weren't uh, heated. Perfectly content, until... The guy came in for the first refill. Little guard and nice fellow. College boy, as you call him. And he'd never been anything but nice to us. And I immediately resented that little squirt. Why? Because he was, had half a jag on. I was feeling very happy. I could smell his breath. And then I started telling him what a bunch of no good they were. I'd get away with this guard, I knew it. And I said, back home they give us all, all we want to drink every day. So that's so. And and he says, well, I'll get beaten if I get caught giving me any saggy. And I uh, kept on. He says, well, hurry up and get your cup. And we were issued three utensils, tinware, cup, what we call a rice bowl, a little larger container, and then a soup bowl, which is still larger. And these I had in the corner of the kitchen there, in the dark. And I went over and I never even touched that cup. That was out of the question. I did finger momentarily that rice bowl, and I thought, the hell with it, I'll never get another chance. First class, I took the soup bowl back. Poor little guy's eyes popped right out of his head. I guess I practically sobered him up, and he uttered a Japanese expression, which means a lot. He said, Pox on. And uh, I said, well, uh, let your conscience be your guide. Just put what you want in there. And he put a little over half full, and he cautioned me to keep this in the dark and get it down as fast as good, and if I got caught, not to tell him where I got it. I had his hand was around his shoulders, and I said, we're friends. I said, you can count on me to the end of this earth. I got that thing down, not because he wanted me to get it down in a hurry, because I wanted to get it down in a hurry. It was just a couple of gulps to get that down. Boy, I was waiting for that warm glow. Lighted up fresh cigarettes and sat down there. And I started damning these guys mentally. I well, what the heck these squares doing? There isn't even any kick in this junk. That glow didn't come. At least I thought it didn't. Then during the evening, I lost track of time, but uh, several other guards came out and some of those were nasty ones, but they weren't nasty to me anymore, and they didn't have to walk in there. When I'd hear their footsteps, I was right over there, and I had that black op curtain open so they could walk in. My arms were around some of the real rough ones, too. And I got saggy out of everybody that came in there. <laughs> what a bum. But that... And then I thought, well, by gosh... These guys, what kind of a party is this? They're not coming out here anymore. There's no track of time. I, because I might say here, I've been accused of being drunk by my wife, my bosses, manning officers, officers of the law, everybody else. But I never, I, I would swear them down I was never drunk. To me, when I was drunk was when, I wasn't even, I wasn't even drunk if I were laying on the floor. As long as I could see you, drop you, I was not drunk. But when I was blacked out and couldn't remember, then I would admit to being drunk. But uh, anyhow, I was getting along this stage there. And uh, so the thought that I said I would never do in my mind, I did. I thought, well, these players are never coming out here, so I'll just help myself to a bottle of their whiskey. I mean, they're sacky. And I guess I must have uh, demolished one whole bottle. And then something happened, which was unusual, because what should have happened, I should have passed out right over that case of whisk, uh, sacky. But I didn't. I, I thought I heard a, a voice or a rain. It was, it was cussing myself. It was boring to you. Well, no good line so-and-so. You've always said you want to sleep warm one night. Why the hell don't you let well enough alone? You'll stay warm all night with a sack and you go and go to bed. And I was in, in the process of answering myself. Remember I leaned forward on the stove and to steady myself, my right hand went out to steady myself. And I saw steam coming up off my hand there, so I had to get that off, so I put my left one down and got the right one up. Then I saw steam coming off the other one, and then I staggered out. I remember slipping down in the ice and snow, but it wasn't cold. And I don't, I don't think there was any guard on duty. Anyhow, I got in there. I didn't have to wrap, wrap up in my cotton blanket, uh, because I'd have stayed warm all night. I got permission to sleep in the next morning, but of course that didn't mean anything to me. I heard two guards arguing about heat. The head guard said he could sleep in. The other one says, yes, but Saki. Uh, boy, oh boy, this is just like home or any other place. They always notice it, don't they? 
So I got up and bowed politely and asked for permission to go to the bathroom. He had to do that there. And I went out and took this pump of cold, ice cold water out and back and pumped it all over my head and shoulders. And that winter weather tried to get by so that they wouldn't find out. I'm sure that some of those guards knew, but they were just nice enough guys not to turn me in because they didn't want to see me beaten to death. So, even in a Japanese prison camp, I mention this merely for those of you to realize that uh, the boys in the sheriff's department or the police department, they haven't got a chance with you if the Japanese guards can't do it. <laughs> you got to be that desire within the person himself. And I don't care how mean your wife is or how mean you think she is. You can't do it either until you want to. And vice versa. Like you talk about periodic drunks and the, the guys that drink straight through. There's no difference in drunks. There's only two kinds of drunks, male and female. After the war was over, I decided that, excuse me, I decided that I wanted to be a different person because the first indication I got was that Whiskey didn't go down so well. Everybody was offering me water glasses full cool because I guess they remembered how I drank. And, of course, I was never declared as a prisoner. Everybody thought I was dead. They'd even given me the Medal of Honor posthumously and the Marine Corps dug up a Navy cross to go along with the Executive Department's decision. They'd even put out Marine posters on me as a recruiting thing. And they'd even written nice stories about me. And uh, they'd even dedicated a park. I was really a great guy, a great tactician, you know, and all this. Point. Nothing too good for you when you're dead. But, I mean. <laughs> but the mistake they made was putting this in writing and, uh, you know. And <laughs> well, this whiskey they were offering me and showing me all these beautiful things written about me, the whiskey didn't seem to go down. Of course, it was quite natural. I appreciated all this good food, you know, like ham and eggs and steak and whatnot, which I hadn't had for 20 months. And, uh, of course, I didn't stop to realize soon that I had my share of food, that, uh, because I didn't know any better, that I'd be back to my bourbon again. But I thought, like, guys, I don't care for this stuff anymore, because I would leave it to go to the food. And I was eating about 10 times a day. And reading these stories, boy, that old head got out here. Wham. And I thought, well, my gosh, they finally changed their tune and calling me a drunken bum. Uh, just saying I was a great guy. Well, I thought, well, my gosh, this is awful nice. I'm going to... Now that they finally realize it, I'm going to do just exactly that. But there's only one thing I, I had a reservation there, because I started growing a mustache. I had to hide behind something. No offense to any Jews that wear a mustache. But that was just for me. And I came back home. I got along fine for a while. I signed to an end with Bon Tour, and I did quite well. I guess I must have sold a lot of bonds for Uncle Sam. And then uh, some of these people I promised to marry and whatnot, they, I, they weren't the type of people, you know, that were ordinarily taking me up on it. Uh, but then they thought that money went with fame and uh, so forth, and uh, doesn't. But uh, my troubles were mounting, and uh, so I got more nervous, and I got my belly full of food, and then I got back to my drinking, and uh, ordinarily I waited till the last talk was over during the day before I started blacking out. Well, except the last talk I gave, which is typical of my life, I never finished anything. I was in Portland, Oregon. And uh, one of the committee there says, why don't you have a few drinks? So you're going to really give them a stuff the blood and guts. Uh, I thought that was a good idea. Uh, the guy that's traveling with me was my intelligence officer overseas. Now it's Keith Harper's assistant down in uh, L.A. Old black is calling he tried to caution this committee again, but uh, they said, no, he'll give a terrific talk. So I drank with the committee until it was time to lead me into the group. It wasn't quite as many as we had here. It was about 300. But they were the wealthiest people in Portland. This was an extra deal they'd arranged. And I started out, and I told them that uh, what they wanted to hear me talk about, I knew. It was about how I was wounded in the leg while I was shooting them down on my back. 40,000 feet to keep the blood from going out of my body. <laughs> Wasn't going to tell about that. I was going to say the war couldn't have been one of the one for slobs like you that supplied the money. <laughs> and I went. Well, 
That was one time where nobody ganged up at the speaker's table and shook my hand. Boy, they were out of that place. First opportunity. Anyhow, that ended up otherwise successful bond to the drive of two and a half months of the match. I think they're still talking about it because I occasionally run into somebody from Portland. Time doesn't dim it down any. Uh, I might add here the Marine Corps finally got rid of me gracefully. I was shot up, so they didn't have to retire me as a psycho patient when I bought it. And they were getting rid of all the excess then, and I was certainly excess. Because uh, at the time there, I kept the Marine Corps headquarters busy, they say, 48 hours in a 24-hour day, trying to find out where in the devil I was and uh, what was going on. And the newspapers were short of uh, material, the war was over, and I guess I was helpfully supplying them. That stuff, boy, I dropped and sure to it. I couldn't remember what I promised to do or where I was supposed to be or anything else. Then I set the business world on fire. Six jobs, I lasted about I think four months along with any of them. I did, a, I did a whole of a job when I first started. Got people mad at me that had to work alongside of me because nobody wants to work at a fast pace. That's like running them a mile at a hundred yard dash pace. I realize now why I did that, not to get people angry at me. I knew that oh, practically all my jobs were involved in selling. It seemed that I could sell anything that wasn't any good. And of course when you're in that type of produce, uh, they'd hire the devil himself. Anyhow, the reason I did this is because I knew a big fat drop was coming up and uh I'd already had a couple and uh and they forgive you if you're you're bringing the company some business for a few drunks and uh high expense accounts and whatnot. But when I figured the handwriting was on the wall, boy I'd go in and resign. This happened in all cases. And in all except one, they offered a better my monetary Enumeration, and all of them, they offered the better the condition. But I couldn't resign just like a normal human being. I had to go in and put on a show. In other words, I said, uh, the only reason I'm telling you this is because maybe you'll treat the next guy that comes along better. And I, and then when they'd offer me this, I'd say, no, I can't do that. I said, maybe you don't know me very well. But when I make up my mind, I stick to it. Wow. Anyhow, that's the way I left. But I finally found my, my job. I stuck at this for six years. I was up here calling, too. The last week I was up here, I don't remember any part of it. But, uh, alcoholics find their place under the bridge or down here on, what is it, Howard Street or whatnot. It's an amazing thing. Uh, people think that uh, all of them are down places like that. They don't realize you can be the president of a bank or, or numerous other important jobs and still have the same disease. But it's so true. Anyhow, this was with one of the national breweries. And three days after I started there, I found a job that you didn't have to report in in the morning. Now, that's very convenient for a guy, just like the old pub out in the South Pacific, because sometimes I had a little trouble getting the old eyeballs back where they looked halfway decent and putting lotions on my face and all this stuff, you know, that looked halfway as respectable. And, uh, not having to report in, well, not there. A couple of times, there were ten days before they heard from me. No twice during this job of the brewery, because I thought this was my job. No, another thing, this expense account was twice the size of my salary, and then I didn't have to listen to my wife saying that I was spending any of her salary on booze. Of course, as it worked out, many times you got a call for God's sake, go down, borrow 600 bucks, I don't know why I picked that figure from the Bank of America, put it in the bank. Why? Well, I didn't know how many checks I'd written. So, the credit account wasn't enough. Anyhow, I figured they were about ready to relieve me from this wonderful job. I figured this was my true career because being paid for drinking, gosh, what could be sweeter? So, first I went to a psychiatrist. My wife suggested this, but I was uh, intrigued with the idea. And uh, I went about six months twice a week. And I was thoroughly intrigued with this man, and I was sober every time I reported over there. And he was equally intrigued with me. Made me feel very important, much like the first two heads that ever been pickled in the ball. 
Because he brought in free of charge, uh, psychiatrists from the University of Southern California and UCLA. And I power blocks, I get pictures, I did everything. And I like the reaction on their faces. They're a dead giveaway, these guys. Well, after about six months there, something happened. One night, my wife received a telephone call from a bartender in Hollywood and said, you better come down and get Pappy before the police get him. He's asleep in the middle of a fire and floor. So, Franny came down and she got me. Got me in the car, and the time we were going over this swing of path into the valley, I started coming through a little bit, and I noticed he didn't turn off this bomb turnoff which goes down the highway. Going straight ahead. I said, hey, you aren't going home. He says, no, you've forgotten. This is your night for the psychiatrist. I said, I can't go there. I'm drunk. Oh, yes, you are. Oh, she drove me down there, and this was consultant night. Some young doc in there from the university. And I noticed uh, out of the back, this young doctor especially was frightened with my appearance and whatnot. So this pleased me. So I grabbed him by the coat there, a handful of the coat down about the waist, and pulled his coat over to the pail and grabbed that. And I leered in his face, you know, laughed, and I picked him up and sat him on a table and said, let me do it to you tonight, Doc. <laughs> Well, the boy that was taking the money, he ran out from the lobby and he got to call the Franny and uh, said, for God's sake, get him out of here. She says, well, I just wanted to bring him over here because maybe he didn't tell you that drinking was his problem. <laughs> well, I sure talked around that thing for six months, but I did have a wonderful time with these fellas until that last night I was sorry to see it end. And once after that, Trouble came again. I knew the psychiatry was out. I decided I would find something high class. I found a high class sanitarium where they make, uh, give you an abuse, show you what it'll do and whatnot. And they give you a little gas treatment in between time with a mixture of carbon dioxide and oxygen that, that if you temporarily feel all wound up, you take an aviator's mask and you put this on. You can do it yourself. And when you pass out, your hand drops off. And this will give you the same feeling as blacking out, only when you come to, just a few seconds later, uh, you're all relaxed. The tension's out of your neck and everywhere. Well, now, I thought this was a good idea, and the doctor did too, because this is the same as a blackout drunk. But there's only one thing wrong with this. If you do this, you come out and you feel good. A drunk doesn't like that. When he comes out of a blackout, he wants to have his clothes a mess, find puke all of them. Pardon me, they have a lovely second dinner night. And he wants to have his money and his watch gone and all that stuff. <laughs> and you can't do it if you do it with this gas in your own home. So I don't want to try that. Then, I finally got to the point where, uh, I just, uh, knew that my periodic drunks were going to merge into one. And some people are afraid of death. I was afraid of the permanent blackout was, let's say, insanity is is the word. Things would be going on, I wouldn't remember. In fact, I could imagine myself being up at Camarillo there, which is uh, the closest uh, nut house that we got down there. And I'd be playing cribbage, which I always loved to play, and I always made money. I'd be winning money from these fellows, and I wouldn't know it. And my wife would be spending my pension on some guy, I wouldn't even know his name. Oh, it's too horrible to think of. So, I, I knew I couldn't go on drinking. I knew they wouldn't fire me from the brewery, because, because gosh, I did sober up and worked like a dog in between times, and so I told him that I was going to resign. Call up Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't think it would work. In fact, many a time I'd come home without my car in a cab and I'd have these pamphlets shoved in pockets and save you pamphlets in other pockets. And boy, I didn't want anything to do with religion. I figured that uh, some of the people I've known had been saved by religion. I mean, their drinking had, but I figured, well, now, by guys, that might work on the drinking. But if it cured my drinking... <coughs> I probably wouldn't want to snap garbage anymore or anything. So religion was out. And then I thought, well, I've always avoided Alcoholics Anonymous or even the slightest suggestion of it. I better look in. So I called them. Well, people came over and saw me, talked to me. I liked them. And I went to my first meeting out in Beverly Hills there, and I ran into some people that I drank with in the past. Some of them I never knew had a drinking problem. If they were there, they were in AA. 
Others I knew definitely had a drinking problem, but what I didn't know was that some of them hadn't been drinking for three, four, and five years. On track of them. But the big thing there was that instead of hiding all this stuff, there they were laughing and joking about it. And some of these things are pretty doggone grim. Just the like. Nobody was trying to shove religion down my neck. I got along fine for about four months, and then I had to go to work somewhere. So I got a nice selling job. Stopped going to AA meetings for a month. One night I decided to have some vodka. You know, that leaves you breathless and penniless and everything else. <laughs> Boy, that hit me faster than it ever had before, and the four-month layoff didn't help a bit. So then I knew what these boys were talking about when they said it's progressive. I went back the following night to an AA meeting. A lot of people, that uh, they call that a sweat, but there's no sweat in my vocabulary. That's about four weeks of premeditated thinking in order to get a drink down you. That's a sweat in my vocabulary. Maybe you can do it sooner in a week. Maybe it takes a longer six weeks. But anyhow, that's neither here nor there. I knew where I belonged, and I went back, and I wasn't the least bit ashamed. I like these people. Some of them are crazier than others, but that's not for me to judge. But I just love them all. Any degree they are along the ladder. I just thank God they're here helping themselves and helping me too. And since then, I've taken the heed there and whenever they ask me to do something, I've been more than willing to do it. I've talked my fool head off and I've picked up uh, people. The last one there was somebody I talked to down at Lincoln Heights Jail, Big Bastille in L.A. And, uh, this fellow, I had to fire him once on one of these jobs when I was managing an apartment store. The guy was drinking too much. <laughs> and uh, here I meet him in the jail. He's since given up the clothing business and uh, gone into welding and he was in jail because he'd wander away from these uh, honor farms, you know. And uh, so then he finally got 16 months and he was out. His wife called and he was getting drunk the first day out. Somebody had put at his two weeks hotel bill and... Uh, I know she got my wife on the phone for it. Well, she says, well, Greg can't do anything if he's drinking or if he doesn't call him. So a couple of days later, he calls me, and I go down, and I get him out of the hotel. He's run up a few other bills there. And uh, so I take him out to one of the places we sponsor out in the valley, a uh, 12-step house for men. So I get him, get him all lined up in there, and while I'm in the back room paying the bill, get out, he's already left. So you have those things happen. Uh, first they bothered me, and now I realize that all I can do is what I can, or tell them about it, or lug them out to some place where they can talk AA, and if they want to walk out, well, that's their own business. So no doubt the poor guy's back in the jug again. I don't know, but uh, it's the best place for him if he doesn't want to try AA. But for myself, uh, as I told you, I found the place where I... I actually feel a part of, and it brought me back in society. But more important than that, I love this way of life, trying to live a day at a time, which I never did. I was a dreamer, always planning the future and unhappy today, or cursing myself for stuff I did in the past. I do many things now that I did in the, in the past, but I don't trust myself anymore. I still fight verbally, sometimes physically, but not unnecessarily. And, uh, I, for years, went around bars here, even in this town, when the kind police force would take me back to the hotel. You know, I swear you can't get arrested for being drunk in this town, because you've got no that right. <laughs> Anyhow, I, my favorite subject, I would never talk about flying, I knew a little too much about that, but I could uh, sure talk medicine or psychiatry. And uh, people say, well, you ought to write a book. I said, as a matter of fact, I got one just about completed, and you'll see it on such and such a day. Well, when I got sobered up, I found out I had some time on my hands, and I made good that threat. I am an author now, and I've made good a lot of other things I drunkenly boasted about. The only regret I had, I won't have enough years in my life to make good all the things I boasted about. But I am contented and happy and getting more so every day that goes on. And in this way of life, I want to thank all you people for having it here when this drunk came in the door the first time. 
You're a wonderful audience. Thanks for listening to me, and good night. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.